Okay, good morning. Thanks very much for coming along. Um, should be interesting, I think, this morning. Um, so, good work in Health in Scotland in terms of setting the scene. Um, Val himself are just going to provide a, an overview. Um, and we're going to cover um, a wee bit of context. Thalia will talk about work that she's been involved in, a uh, literature review, review on good work in Scotland. Um, and then we're going to talk about a wee bit of work that Health Scotland's been involved in, in terms of a research report drawing on uh, data from the Scottish Health Survey, um, describing uh, uh, health in Scotland by occupation and industry, and then some broad conclusions, and hopefully it'll all link seamlessly um, to, together. So this is quite a busy landscape. Um, if we think about it, we've got, for example, the Marmot Report um, back in 2010, talking about um, the principles of, of fair work there um, and good work. Uh, we've got, for exa examples, uh, of the, the Glasgow Centre like a number of years ago, looking at the rise of in-work poverty and its relation to health. We've got uh, the, the Scottish Parliament Report, um, taking the high roads. Um, we've got uh, the, our own inequalities briefing from Health Scotland and the Oxfam, UW, Oxfam UWS reports. Um, what makes for decent work? This is the interim report. You'll see the final report actually came out this week. Um, and also the Fair Work frame, uh, framework from the Fair Work Convention. Um, and most recently, for example, the Scottish Government's labour market strategy. So it is quite a busy landscape, just to set some of the context. Um, Valley will now come up and talk through the literature review that she's involved in. Thank you. Okay, so hello from me too. Um, so about a year ago today, actually, I started working under Martin's supervision on a literature review regarding the relationship between health and um, um, and uh, work. Um, so um, this literature review mainly fo focused on the UK, but it was also it did also extend to other countries within the EU. So we thought it might be interesting just to mention some points uh, before going on to looking at the situation in Scotland as such um, that might be relevant to what we'll see later on. So um, later on, Martin's going to actually talk about whether and how particular occupations and industries are related to health outcomes with, in, for their workers. Um, but I would, before he does that, I would just like to add an extra component to that equation, uh, another level of complexity, if you'd like to see it that way. So um, I'm referring to work-related factors that from the literature review seem to be related to health outcomes and impact health, or else, more simply put, working conditions and characteristics. So from the literature review I did, um, I found that these can be sort of grouped. So first off, we have the, what we call the psychosocial characteristics. Um, so probably quite familiar to most of you in here. Um, first off, we have Karasik's job control and demand uh, model uh, that has also been recently extended to um, include a social support at work element. Then we have the effort reward imbalance model, which kind of talks about how the rewards one receives from their work uh, may counterbalance the effort they put into their work. Uh, and then obviously another factor that impacts health is whether there is organizational injustice where someone works. Um, the second group are what we call the physical working conditions. Now, these are kind of broad because they can vary from anything like the environmental conditions one works in, so um, physical conditions like noise and temperature of the workplace. Um, but they also uh, can lead to a more um, how demanding the work is physically, uh, for example, if it um, requires heavy lifting, repetitive movement, and things like that. Then next up, we have uh, characteristics not actually of the work itself, but of the contract one signs with their employer. So uh, in the contractual arrangements group, you can imagine things like hours work per week, or whether somebody is involved in full-time or part-time employment. And then finally, we've got um, quite a complex little group. Um, uh, we have how secure one feels in uh, their 
job and how satisfied they are by it. Now, these are particularly complex because they also are affected by the previous one, so it's kind of like a circle. Okay, so how does all this then relate to the industries and occupations that Martin's going to talk about later on? Um, so first off, obviously, I'd just like to say that all the graphs and tables I'll be using up here uh, have derived from the literature review we conducted. Um, so this table, quite simply, just shows the particular occupations in which workers were found to uh, have poor general health in, in general or uh, their mental health was at risk. So you can see elementary occupations here, craft and related trades, skilled agricultural and plant machine operators, all in our sort of the worst off, if you can allow me that sort of phrase, uh, occupation-wise. So if we look at this next graph, now what this shows, it, it classifies the occupations by the levels of physical risks encountered in each occupation. So if we consider that the EU average is 100, so that's the sort of average level in the European Union, we can see that four of these occupations do exceed this average level. And if you look at which ones they are, they are exactly the same ones that we encountered in the table before as those that have the adverse health outcomes. So again, craft and related trades, skilled agricultural uh, workers, plant and machine operators, and elementary occupations. So there seems to be an overlap. And we also notice that when we're talking about psychosocial characteristics, so let me just explain this graph here. So uh, here we're referring to the job control demand model I mentioned before. So on the vertical axis, you have job uh, autonomy. So that's how much control one has over their work. And on the, ver on the horizontal one, sorry, we have work intensity. So how demanding the work is. So obviously, the occupations that are sort of worst off are going to be the ones that have low levels of job autonomy and high levels of work intensity. So simply put, the ones in the bottom right quadrant. So again, we can see here we've got some of the occupations that we encountered before. So elementary occupations are still there, craft and related tr uh, uh, trades and plant and machine operators have also got high levels of psychosocial risks. So obviously there seems to be an overlap between the occupations that are characterized by high levels of either physical or psychosocial risks and the ones that are also known to be worst off sort of health-wise. We can also make exactly the same argument, only this time with the industries, okay? So similarly, we've got the tables here for uh, the industries either in the UK or across the EU that um, reportedly have high levels of various health problems. So there are a couple here that keep coming up. So you have uh, construction, agriculture, manufacturing, health and social care, and transport. They seem to come up quite ra rather frequently. And if we look at the respective graphs again once more, with the EU average level being 100, we see that construction, agriculture, and industry, so industry actually here refers to manufacturing and utilities, and also health and transport, so the ones we saw that have adverse general health are also, um, also exceed the uh, average EU levels of uh, physical risks. Um, and again, once more, we're just gonna go through the psychosocial risks again. So again, in the job autonomy and work intensity model in the bottom right quadrant, which are those occupations that are worst off, we have health, industry, and transport appearing here too. So basically, um, the sort of take home message for, from all this is that maybe the working conditions in the particular industries and occupations are the linking factor between these occupations and industries and the health outcomes that they are related to. Um, so hopefully this will provide a sort of interesting conte context in which to look at uh, what Marty's gonna uh, talk about later on. Thank you. So the research report then, um, there's lots of data available on, on Britain and on the EU, um, and that's really helpful, but an obvious question of course is, well, what does Scotland look, look like? I could save you some time and say, well, 
a lot of the messages are the same. However, I'm still going to show you the slides. Um, so we wanted to answer two questions really. Can we describe health outcomes and determinants um, by occupation and industry in Scotland? It's just a cross-sectional study. Um, thankfully, well, thankfully, someone's going to come along and talk about some more uh, linked data later on. That'll be, that'll be lovely. Um, and the second thing really is, to, first, can we describe it? And second, do occupation and industry have an independent effect on health outcomes in Scotland? So the way we did this was by um, looking at some descriptive data, drawing on the Scottish Health Survey. We looked at um, four health outcomes, physical and mental health, um, four health behaviours up there on the screen, um, and also BMI, uh, obesity of uh, 30 plus. And we, all looked at, we also looked at workplace stress indicators available in the Scottish Health Survey. We supplemented it by drawing in some annual population survey and annual survey of hours and earnings data just to sort of provide some context um, as well. Um, so we were able to do this in the end with a lot of help from uh, Craig Kellogg and colleagues at the Scottish Government. Um, occupation industry don't usually appear um, in the Scottish Health Survey, survey, but they are in the underlying data, so they were able to help us actually derive that, and we could, we could look at that. For 25 occupations, um, and for around about 30 industries in terms of just a descriptive uh, approach. And then for workplace stress and determinants, um, occupations again, and a reduced number of industries um, because of smaller numbers. Uh, the other thing is, is in terms of, well, if you want to look at sort of um, the independent effects, what would be a simple approach to take? And we used um, simple logistic regression just to look at, um, once you account for a range of other um, uh, demographic and socioeconomic factors, um, and indeed health behaviours. Do, do these findings still, still hold? Um, and we, we looked at that for looking at two health outcomes, self-reported health and GHQ12, which is a measure of potential mental health problems. Men and women separately by occupation, and we controlled for gender we, uh, for industry. Um, so, uh, findings number one, so as, as I kind of alluded to, and it seems to be in line with the literature, basically current or past occupation of employment seems to be associated with multiple advantages or disadvantages in health. So basically you get um, a whole cluster of advantages in particular occupations and industries and a whole cluster of disadvantages in other occupations and industries. That's a vast oversimplification, but it's a helpful one. Um, some examples that I'm going to give, um, health outcomes, health behaviours, and uh, demand control. Um, this chart here, just as a very a simple way of looking at um, the, the, the bubbles, show you the, the number of uh, men aged 16 to 64 in Scotland who um, were either employed at the time or um, had, were previously employed in uh, different types of occupation. Um, so large uh, occupation types there, for example, uh, elementary uh, trades and transport, and transport occupations up there, um, professionals and a big category there called uh, corporate managers down there. Um, what, where you want to be in this chart, really, um, is you don't want to be at the top right-hand quadrant, because um, that would be um, you're ranked in terms of the, you have the poorest uh, physical health and the poorest mental health, and you can see some of the same um, occupations that, that we, we came up earlier on, um, process-type jobs, elementary occupations um, are, are up there, and also transport um, uh, uh, and pr transport occupations as well. Um, the bottom left-hand quadrant, you've got, uh, um, again, a mixture of um, occupations which are relatively favourable, and they include uh, large numbers of professions um, and also some managers down there as well. Um, it's a, a s broadly similar picture for women, although the mix of occupations is, is slightly different. Um, the, the second thing, and the second way to illustrate this is to look at um, uh, risk factors. And we borrowed on a, a paper that basically used a simple indice of um, looking, combining different um, 
uh, risk factors. So, for example, uh, smoking, alcohol consumption, BMI, and so on. Um, what this does is the, the blue bars um, on the left-hand side, they show you if people have zero or one risk factors. Um, so you can see that, for example, um, those uh, least risky occupations up at the top there, you've got um, health professionals, teaching and research professionals, um, and down at the bottom, you've got, in terms of risk factors for men, you've got um, customer service occupations, transport process, and some elementary occupations down there at the bottom as well. Um, the demand control um, chart that Thalia showed late, earlier on, um, this repeats it for uh, occupations in Scotland, and basically you don't want to be in the bottom right-hand quadrant. The two occupations that emerged um, as having the potentially highest levels of job strain were customer service occupations, so for example, content, uh, contact centre work, and uh, protector services, which would be um, like frontline police officers and prison officers. Interestingly, um, for that group, the latter group, protector services, um, they don't appear to have the worst health outcomes, so there's possibly something else going on there. The other point to note is there's a much larger group of occupations in the bottom left-hand side, which has got low control, and again, it might not come as a surprise, but the occupations that come up there um, include process-type jobs, um, elementary occupations, um, and also caring occupations are there as well. So it's uh, worth reflecting on that, given the links between low control at work and poor health. So the second set of findings really was to look at whether um, uh, there were independent things going on in terms of occupation and industry. And the first point is that um, once you control for other, other factors, being in paid employment has a strong effect on health outcomes, a strong positive effect on health outcomes. But occupation is um, independently associated in, in this data, and it's cross-sectional data, with poorer self-reported health, and for men, um, higher GHQ 12 scores. Um, there are also some industries to watch out for that emerged as particularly um, damaging after you control for a whole range of other factors. Um, land transport is there for poor self-reported health, for example, and some other manufacturing in industries. Um, there are uh, behavioural risk factors. They do emerge as uh, important as well, um, as, in do, as indeed does living in a low-income household. So just to uh, illustrate the point, this chart shows you the independent effect of being in good or very good health for men, um, aged 16 to 64 years. Um, you'll see a whole list of occupations uh, on the left-hand side there. Um, the red uh, squares uh, to the left indicate your risk of being in poorer, having poorer self-reported health, um, all the other things being equal. And there's a whole list there. They tend to cluster um, Again, in terms of um, process jobs, textile jobs, elementary occupations, um, there for self-reported health. Um, it's worth noting the protective effect of being in employment, um, of uh, physical, physical uh, activity as well, um, and of fruit and veg consumption for men, um, and also the, the potentially um, negative impact of low income even after you control for being in work and, and types of occupation for men. It's a similar picture in terms of self-reported health for, for women. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, for GHQ12, which is a measure of negative mental health, this time the right hand of the chart um, indicates a higher risk of having poorer, self, it's poorer uh, potential risk of mental health problems. Um, a smaller list of occupations for men, but it's observed for uh, customer service occupations and caring occupations, along with uh, one of the professions up there as well. Um, also, the protective effects, again, of being in work um, and, of a, uh, and, and the risk of being in a low-income low -income household. For women, um, for occupations at least, um, there wasn't an effect of, a dependent effect observed on mental health for um, 
occupations. The other factors are still there, so low income is still important, and the other uh, risk factors that I've mentioned earlier on. But that's just for mental health. So just to conclude then, um, that the inequalities that we see in other labour markets are present in Scotland as well. And with some caveats, the type of work that people do uh, matters very much for their health. And poverty-free good work is good, is good for health, not just any work. Um, there are important questions about how gender, class and other characteristics influence this. Um, and other people are going to talk about some of that hopefully this morning. So, okay, thank you. Thanks.